and welcome to Mount Asher Gardens and here we are and uh, all ready to go quite miraculous with all the things that had to be done but here we are so that's brilliant okay I hope that you can all hear me well the um, the weir is quite noisy and um, uh, but it's very attractive so um, if you're having problems hearing then there's a chat box right beside the video you're watching so just write in on the chat box we're monitoring it and any questions or any comments you um, ask will be um, answered okay all right let's get going then so this is an acrylic uh, demonstration of capturing the autumn colors um, out in the landscape as you can see by all the layers <laughs> Painting outside um, in the autumn is uh, a little um, um, uh, hardy for those who want to go out, but the, the benefits are, um, are, are enormous. Now, I'm afraid I made a slight mistake. We had planned to um, do this last weekend for Halloween, but a big storm rolled in, so we couldn't do it then. And I forgot the clocks changed, so we're even one hour later in the evening. So the lovely light that floods through here, we haven't really got a light, light day today. Um, let's hope it comes out in the next little while, but we are actually a little further on into the day than I had intended. But anyway, there we go. We have some people watching from America at 7 a.m. So if we'd gone an hour earlier, they'd have had to get up at 6 a.m., which is a bit cruel. So anyway, here we go. So this is acrylics. Now acrylics are, um, a plastic sort of paint um, and what we do is we use a, a medium it's called acrylic medium this is a gloss medium and what I do is I put it with the paint at a good amount this, this paint already has some on it and you see it looks white when it comes out but it dries completely transparent so don't worry about how it looks when it comes out put a good amount out there because that will make the paint creamy for you. Okay, now we're gonna start by drawing. And if we're drawing, then um, we actually want to dilute the paint. Everything's good and live. Everything's good and live. Okay, my son's come to tell me we're all good. So I'll keep going. Um, so when we're drawing, all we're going to do is establish the main shapes. So we, in the Irish School of Landscape Painting, made a four-stage method, which was a combination of my, uh, of my dad's um, um, brilliant <laughs> painting, <laughs> no other word for it, Kenneth Webb, um, and, um, and my mother's scientific background. I'm also a little bit scientific and analytical. So we have four clear steps for you to follow. So the first stage, is to select and to draw in the composition. Now, obviously, I have already selected where exactly to put this canvas, where exactly to sit, and exactly what I'm going to um, put in. So I'm going to take from to the left of that very big tree um, there. These trees are really special trees. And as somebody who knows my Tasha Gardens likes to um, give us a shout, you can tell us exactly what these trees are and all about them, because I'm no botanist, so all I do is paint. <laughs> So, um, but this lovely big tree across to the um, golden tree over there is my view with the weir. So let's go, go about putting it in. So having decided on my view, like this, this is watered down paint. So water dissolves acrylic. It's the solvent that dissolves it. Now I'm just gonna stand up. I'm sure Matt Donovan's gonna shout at me for this, but I'm gonna stand up for a few minutes because it's, I can actually see down in to get the whole view if I'm sitting because the canvas is partly in the way. But I'll sit for the rest of the uh, demonstration. Now, the first thing for me to do is to mark in my, my, my main trees. So um, that's a question of experience. It's a question of guessing. Um, it's a guesstimate to begin with. If you're a bit experienced, your guesses are more likely to be right. But it's guess. So make a mark. And if it goes wrong, you just take a damp tissue and you can um, uh, wipe it out. So let me um, let me see. I think we'll go for that big tree there. And this one here. Now I'm, I'm trying to angle them a bit so they're not like sticks sticking up. So see the bottom of that is 
further away from the canvas than the top. So it's making a triangle. And then the next biggest uh, fair is behind this golden tree. So I might angle him a bit that way. Okay, and then we've got the weir itself. We need to mark where the uh, water is coming. I might sit for that to be a bit steadier. Do you see if I sit, all I have to do, my, my um, hips are supported. All I have to do is swivel my hips and keep my uh, brush at the, at, the right, at the same level. And all I have to do then is to swivel like that and you get a straight line, more or less. Now it dips down where it goes over the, ve the weir, so let's um, dip it down a bit. And I might just, well, I suppose that's good enough. There's always the temptation to fiddle with it. You, you want to get your main shapes in and not fiddle too much, but you do want to check the line is straight. You see, by taking a, a definite measure measurement, tucking your finger underneath the canvas and keeping your uh, brush steady, then you can check that it's a straight line. Now, the next thing is to decide on the angle of the weir. So all I'm doing is putting a few straight lines in. If you can draw a straight line, have a go. And if you can't draw a straight line, use a ruler. <laughs> so, okay. Now, I have to decide what angle this weir is going to come at, and I'm just going to do it with a straight line to begin with. Now, that straight line means I'm going to do another straight line because, actually, I think I'm going to include that gate over there. As soon as you start working on a picture, things evolve. So I'm going to include this little gate, which is just over to my side, uh, which I hope you can see. But I'm going to get these trees in the background in first, just so that I get a... Um, a, a feel for what's happening. I didn't really mean to pick up red. It just happened to be red in the, in the, in the um, palette. Now, um, when, when we decided to do this demonstration um, and, and came and talked to Catherine and, and um, Conrad, Catherine and Conrad Jay, they, they own the, I'm in the private part of the gardens and, and, the, and it's there, so they very kindly allowed me to set up here for the day. And um, I, th that, that tree was absolutely glorious, but of course, um, along came the storm last weekend, so uh, it's not quite as gorgeous now. So I might put a few more leaves on it than there really are. So I'm just marking in this next tree, which has also lost a good few leaves. It was, it was, um, uh, had red tinges to it, red berries or red tinges anyway. So. No. Let's get the uh, path in. So, we want a path. We want a path. So, do you see what I'm doing? All I'm doing is building up geometric shapes. So, <coughs> those who've been following our regular Tuesday morning live stream um, and, and looking at Cezanne with me, do you see we have rectangle, 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 hopefully all different sizes. I'll measure them in a moment. Triangle, let's break this triangle up again. Um, uh, we're going to have the bottom of the weir. Uh, in fact, the weir, now that we've got the line on it, we could give it the little curve that it has. Do you see it has a... I don't see. But there's a curve to it. There's a very nice flow to it. So we're sitting in Mount Asher Gardens, which are very, a very, very famous Robinsonian garden, which is a style of gardening where they um, uh, work with nature and have it as, as sort, of, sort of wild and garden at the same time. And um, these gardens could have been lost to us in 1979 when the um, gardens were up for sale. Um, the Walpoles, who'd been here for a long time, were selling. 
But fortunately, along came Madeline Jay, the mother of the current owner, Conrad, and, um, and she thankfully purchased it and uh, really um, worked for it for the rest of her, for her life. So we are very grateful to her. She was always here when I would bring, I often bring my uh, classes here to paint and she'd always be there in the morning taking her morning constitutional, always happy to talk. She's passed on now, she was 94 when she, she went, but she was a great lady. Okay, now, so this, these are the red flowers. Again, I don't know what they are, but they're quite delightful up against the dark reflections. And this is the line of the wall. And now we want, it, we want to put in a um, gate. So we don't want it to be too high up. So if I want to know where that gate comes in, 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 in alignment with the landscape, what I do is, maybe you can't see if I go off screen, uh, I take my, my brush as a horizontal line, lay it on top of the gate, and then see what part of the landscape it bisects. So it comes, actually, surprisingly enough, um, just above the uh, water. And I'm not sure, I think I might want that water to be a bit bigger. Just a tiny bit taller, I think. So I'm not worrying about whether my drawing is neat or pretty. All it is, is um, uh, an underlying structure for the rest of my painting. That's its function. Now, actually, I don't need to have it over here because the trees are covering over that. So you see how you can rub it out perfectly successfully. Just dip your tissue into uh, water. And if you've got your clothes underneath it, move them out of the way. Oops. Extra jumpers there. Don't want them wet. OK. Now, I think I'll tame down this, um, this bush so it tucks into the corner. So you see how I'm adjusting the composition as I go. So that will allow this big tree here to reflect down into the water. That would be rather nice to have the golden reflections going down into the water. It's not that you see a lot of water there. And, um, and on up we go. Uh, the, this um, skeleton structure of the branches is rather nice up at the top here. I'm just going to cool off for a few minutes. My hat will cool me down. Okay, now as we look across the other side of the gate, it's the, for those who know mine, Tasha, it's the pond area. No? And in the pond area, we don't see the pond, but we can see through to the beautiful um, Maple Drive, which we're not painting today. Another day. Now, let's see. We want the other side of this path to come in. Now, that comes more or less towards us, but don't worry about perspective. If you're following along with this and you don't know about perspective, all you have to do is put a triangle in the corner there. See how easy that is? Just a triangle. I put a little wiggle on my, on my triangle. You don't have to wiggle it if you don't want to. But if you wiggle it, then it makes it easy to put in the pathway that people walk around the pond on the other side here, which is just another triangle and another smaller triangle. And now you've got the curving perspective. So all you need to be able to do in order to get perspective, if you're working from something that I'm doing, is to uh, be able to draw a rectangle, a triangle, and either a circle or curved forms and to know whether you want to put them in big or small and um, 
That's about it, really. It's not that hard. Okay, now. So we've got those uh, big trees in. Uh, let me just check uh, their distances because we, we want them not to be the same. So I'm checking the distance at the bottom and the distance at the top. So they are different. That is good. And let's see that these are different. Okay, so there's all the spacings need to be different. Okay. Now I'm going to stand up again because I can see the background better in relation. Um, so there's a minor tree back here. Um, there's actually a little house back there and this cuts through the house. Probably isn't very obvious on camera. It's amazing how different things look uh, when, you're, when you're standing on the site. They really do. Now that tree is quite close to the first one. That's the other big pine. And then this is a big hidden tree in behind. And I'm making sure that of these trees, I get them um, at different spacings. Now we've got some nice uh, branches coming across here. Which I'm putting in because they're, they're an important part of the, of the picture. Um, and this is a nice furry pattern here and then there's a small tree an upright one okay and I don't want this to be parallel to the first one which it is just off parallel might be enough or I might kink it a little bit more and then there's a small tree beside it okay all right so now this uh, big fir tree has some nice uh, branches that come across and makes a nice triangular shape. And here we've got, do you see the wall that goes up the other side of the river? Basically, it's one long big triangle, isn't it? One long big triangle until we get to this big tree. And then just past the big tree, it goes up a little bit more and then it comes down and it finishes just after that tree. So you see how you can mark it out and keep everything in relation to one another. And I might make that just a little bit smaller because I, I don't want to run out of space for my um, um, trees, all that's going on in the back there. I think that's a more pleasing shape. Now, there's a bit of a hill here, a little bit of a hill, and some rather nice shapes in the greenery here. Oh, at, at where those people are walking, you can see the path goes there. It's rather nice having a person in there. Um, and uh, there's a greeny tree. Greeny tree in there. And a little bit of a house in here. Very hidden. We're not going to make anything very much of it. And some lovely, creepy looking branches going on in there. Okay. Now then, I think we're ready to paint. So stage one complete. Obviously, if I was doing this for myself, 
I would, um, uh, and I take a long time over painting pictures. So uh, having just studied um, Cezanne, I can tell you that he, he would take 100 or 150 hours over a picture. I'm not doing that today. We've got two hours. So I want to, um, to show you some more than tips, some structured technique for um, achieving an acrylic painting and not being afraid to go outside to experience the colors outside. You know, if I took a photograph of this, or if you look at it through the video um, uh, camera, you can probably hardly see that house, which is very clear to me. Um, you, you get a whole different feeling. You get a feeling of the space, the space that there is there, the air that there is between this foreground and the background. Um, it's different to, to, take, to taking photographs. So um, more on that in a moment. Let's show you it. Now, because this is acrylics, acrylics will dry hard. So if you, if you have a brush and you're going to put it down, you at minimum are going to leave it in the water. But I like my brushes, so I clean them off properly when I finish using them. So um, I just have most of the water off shot. <laughs> because the uh, electrics are all down on that side and I don't want to tip them with my arm into the electrics or it might be a very short stream indeed. Okay, so, um, and when I clean my brush, I, I, I re-point it, make sure the, it's just plain water, but I just make sure that it's looked after. Okay, so I'm going now onto a big brush, big brush and and a palette knife. What's the palette knife for, you may ask? Well, for mixing. Now, I can see the sun just over there. It should be just over there, had I got my timing right, not forgotten about the clocks going back when a storm came in. So, um, because it's over there, the sky is actually a little bit mauvey. So this is a mixture of uh, monestial blue or thalo blue, which is a cold blue, and prism violet, and ultramarine blue and white. This is the ultramarine blue and white. Now it's been sitting out here for a little while um, because it, you know, it takes a while to coordinate getting all the cameras and everything ready. Um, I've mixed it already with medium, but you see I remix it with a bit of medium. So it's really nice and creamy. And I put my knife into the water so the acrylic doesn't dry hard on it. Now, a uh, big brush. I have a tissue at the ready in case I want to wipe something off. Oh, I forgot to, I forgot to put these background trees in. <laughs> oh well. Um, it doesn't matter because I have the main shapes in. Now, actually, that sun is sinking, and I think we're going to not get the light that I had wanted. So I am it, rather, do you see what's happening? As I'm sitting here, I'm being really influenced by uh, the sky that's there, that's drawing towards the evening. And in fact, I think that probably you would rather see a bright, cheery, sunny picture. So I'm going to draw from my memory and from my experience of being on the site here, and I, I know that the light goes through the background, and I'm just washing that brush off, and I'm going to instead uh, skip ahead to putting the yellows in. I wouldn't normally do this, but when you're working on the site, you really have to be flexible with what, what, what is thrown at you. And, um, and I think we want to have the plan there of light coming through. So here we go. Um, lost my other knife. Lost it. Oh well, use this knife. It's my special knife because it's a little finer. So I'm just going to mix up a little bit of, uh, oh that's red, uh, lemon and white. Here we go. Uh, Donovan or Matthew, you might tell me, is this second palette on camera? Is the yellow palette on camera? 
I don't know that is. So anyway, I've put it over here so that you can see. So that's just lemon and white, a bit of ochre maybe through it as well. And I'm just going to bring that through the background, just where, just where the um, light comes. So that will make up for me not drawing them in. I'm putting them in with blocks instead. So I'm just varying it between lemon, adding a little bit of ochre with it, because um, uh, this yellow one is visible as well. OK, fantastic. Good. OK, so as, as we come a bit closer to us, I'm using a bit more of the yellow ochre, which is a little bit denser. Do you see it's slightly denser? Again, doesn't take a, a great skill to do this, does it? It's, it's just knowing where to put the paint. So there you are, lemon straight from the tube, and some ochre straight from the tube, and here's a, a little bit of a mix with white as well. So we're taking the light through the background, Easy, easy, easy. Oh, I went over the house. Oh, well. Good old tissue. Let's keep a bit of the house in. OK. So I only discovered recently that, um, that Catherine, Conrad's wife, actually runs an Airbnb from here, which is amazing. So you get to stay in, in the private house here right in the center of these amazing gardens which means you really get to know the place at all times of the day and there's just endless material here to paint endless at all times of year i've already picked out a view that i could do in the winter from here just behind me but, you know, whatever, whatever the season, you always find wonderful material. So here's this glorious um, yellowy orange tree. Um, I have put more leaves on it than there are at the moment. I can bring some blue through it. So that's cadmium orange with the yellow ochre and a touch of the, uh, oops, touch of the lemon. Okay, and then I think we'll even have a touch of the red with the yellow ochre for this tree here. And uh, wash some of that off. And then the light hits onto the top of the wall here as well. Yep, that's as I remember it. Now, I want to go on to blue, so I definitely want to Clean up the brushes. There we go. Now, back to what I was doing with the sky. But see, now that I've got those yellows in, do you see there's the impetus to have it not quite so grey? So um, I'm going to go back to my uh, knife. And mix up a little bit of slightly brighter blue. Remember the monestial blue I was talking about? Just to have a little tinge of that as well. OK, uh, you, could, you could throw that, those two dirty waters for me um, under the dead tree. And, uh, and fill them up if you would. 
my son should know by now. If he comes near me, he gets a job. <laughs> well, while I'm streaming. OK, here we go. So don't worry about the little bit of blue um, uh, mixing with a little bit of, of, of yellow. Uh, because we're using thicker paint and it's mixed nicely with the medium, do you see how it just, it just glides on? It, nothing's any bother to it. Uh, if it becomes a bother, then uh, you just go back to clean your brush and make sure you've got clean paint in the palette. So this is a background anyway for us to put our foliage over. Now I'm using not too thick paint because I'm being cognizant of the fact that because we don't have sunshine on us and because it's later in the year, actually the acrylic may not dry very well. Um, usually you can work very quickly with the acrylic because you have the advantage of it drying quickly. Where do you want me to put the water? Under that dead tree, if you don't mind. And then there's fresh water. In the, in the undergrowth, you don't put it... You mean next to the big tree? Yeah, the big tree. The dead one. The lovely tree. There was a gorgeous tree here. Oh, for years I painted it. Unfortunately, it, it's just a big tree stump now. miss the trees when you're used to seeing them there. Okay, so do you see how I'm not paying any attention to modelling? What I'm paying attention to is, um, you, sweetheart? I'll get down. Okay. Um, what we're paying attention to is just blocking in the main shapes. So again, nothing hard in doing that, is there? Um, if you're struggling to get the paint onto the canvas, what you do is you go back to your canvas, um, back to your palette, and make the paint creamy. Clean up your brush, make the paint creamy, and then go, go back onto the canvas again. It shouldn't be a fight between you and the canvas. So here, as we, um, we're away from the sun um, slightly going down over there, uh, which is more mauve. So over there, it's uh, more of the cold blue than the nestial blue. Just dealing with the water. Um, you need to chuck it underneath the tr old tree there so it doesn't stain and uh, then fill it with fresh water. Thank you. Okay, now, the only tricky thing about this path will be mixing the colour. So I'm going to do the water first. <laughs> Clear a bit of space on the palette. OK, so we're going to take some more of the monestial blue and white, in with a bit of the cobalt blue. And here we go. The water. Not worrying about taking the blue all the way back because if you look at the water, it actually isn't blue back there, is it? Because um, you've got all of the reflections back there, so it isn't blue. Okay, now we take um, slightly darker blue, so that's the ultramarine blue for over here. Right, now, next we're going to do the path. Okay, so we've got this slightly mauvey blue as a base. Now the colour that I would really like is light red, which I don't think I have. 
Light red's a terribly useful colour, a uh, terracotta uh, sort of colour. So instead we'll have to use a little bit of burnt sienna and a bit of yellow ochre. The reason I prefer the uh, light red is because it's a, it's a lighter brine, as, as is implied by its name. Um, it's not as heavy. So the, the path here, which is Tarmacadam, um, it would be very easy to make it very cold, but then you'd have a cold, dark strip at the bottom. So um, if you look into it, there's actually warm bits as well. So I tend to make my paths a little bit warm. There's still blue in it, but you can see that it's a little bit warm. Right. So one other little trick, um, normally I would lift this up and paint underneath the, um, the feet so that we don't end up with little white, white marks there. But because the light is further round, because of the change in the clocks, um, and the sun's over there, if it were full sun it would shine through the canvas and it would have made it very difficult for you to see what you were doing, it would make it difficult for me to see what I was doing. So what we did was we taped boards and things to the back of the canvas. What I would do if I was out on the site is put my coat around the back or, or keep in your car uh, a piece of cloth for that purpose because you never know um, when the sun, um, you, you don't know what angle you're going to take and you don't know if the sun is going to decide that it's, it's, it's moving in that direction and you don't want to be fighting to see what you're painting. So these are all useful things to do on the site. Now, for the wall here, I'm adding a little bit of uh, blue and red, purple. And there's some nice stones in this wall, as well as greens. Okay, now, next, we put in the, the greens. Okay, so clean the brush off again. You can hear I uh, don't hold back when I clean my brushes. You can swill it around quite vigorously in the water and the water cleans it pretty thoroughly. Okay. Now then, green. So, this is olive green, and this is Monestio blue. I'm mixing the two together on the end of the brush because the paint is quite creamy. And we're going to start putting in some of these dark greens. So I'm going to start with the very background tree. Um, so he's just going to sit into the back. So I want to let as, as, as there is there in nature. I want to let the, the light come through. And all I'm doing is taking the paint and uh, tipping it on with fairly generous paint, tipping it on in little comma-like strokes. Very impressionist. That's the sort of stroke they like to use, although a little bit finer. And the fact that we've got the, the blue and yellow behind matters not a jot. So, um, in fact, it's quite nice to have bits of it coming through. Now, 
No. For the next tree, more olive green and a little bit of um, purple. So if you want to, if you have any questions, just write into the chat box and um, the question will be relayed to me. So the um, purpose of this um, outdoor painting trip is to gather information is to capture these colors on the canvas it, 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 it is a tricky thing to do with autumn color you've got to get the timing right to have the color there you've got to have the weather right and um, and you may find it chilly to sit for hours the, the damp can get into the bones a bit but it is entirely worth it because the freshness with which i for me um, the freshness with which I paint on site is not something that I uh, would, would be able to do from a, from a photograph. If, whether, if I were working from a photograph, I would, I would become... Now I'm using a little bit of, of um, alizarin crimson in with the um, olive green. Might even use a tiny bit of sap as well. Um, I say yeah there's no way I would get this um, freshness um, from a, from a photograph so th the way that we work in the school we're, we're very much a plein air school when the weather is good I do appreciate that not everybody wants to come out on the site in the, in the winter um, so we run the classes in the winter indoors um, with a, a few outdoor trips for the hardy um, but this, what I'm doing now, of that tree, I wouldn't do from the photograph because I get caught up in the, the, the minute detail of exactly where this branch goes and where that branch goes instead of seeing the big picture, instead of getting the feel of it. Because the photograph, whilst it may be awe-inspiring and incredibly beautiful, doesn't give you that feel of base of sitting here of being here and and while i'm sitting here looking at this i'm um, subconsciously absorbing it so when i take my sketch even my sketch is rough my sketch for me has the quality of being here imbued in it um, and it gives a life to the finished picture that um, i simply uh, couldn't do for, uh, entirely from photographs now, photographs are a great visual aid. They're a great reminder of what's on site. And, and when allied with your memory, um, can be a wonderful tool. So if you really don't want to, to work on the site because you really can't um, manage with the cold, or it's somewhere where you can't work on the site, you don't get permission to be there, or it's not safe, you know, it's standing in the middle of the road. There's often good views in the middle of the road. Don't recommend painting in the middle of the road. But even if you're able to make a drawing, so you have some visual reference that you bring back from the site, it's not only that you have the reference, it's the fact that you spent the time there looking at the shapes and analyzing the site. It gets into your skin um, if you spend some time on the site. Um, and you get to know the view, you just get to know it. And it shows, for me. So that's why I take the trouble to go out on the site. I have to say, we have to say a big thank you to Donovan because he had to come home. Um, he had to completely dismantle our streaming setup for the studio, which is gonna need to be set up again for the Tuesday morning class. To bring it all out here <laughs> so thank you Donovan now 
here I am, this is a permanent green light. So I'm just now filling in those, those bushes. Um, some people do better at, at, at drawing or painting if they see things as a block. So I'm looking at this as a block that's <coughs> basically a little rectangle or a four-sided figure. And then I only have to think, is this four-sided figure light or dark, warm or cold? And in it goes. So some people do better with seeing it as blocks. Some people do better by following the line and, um, and, and make beautiful shapes with an outline. Now then, so by and large, I'm blocking in the bigger areas first. Can you see that? Um, I'm going to do this tree next because um, it's sitting up there. Um, and I got the right colors. But you see, I left out a bit of the sky. Fortunately, I've got a bit of color on the, on the palette that's almost the right color to fill it in. because that's actually a bit of sky between the, um, the leaves and it's rather nice. So I don't mind which way I do it, um, whether I um, painted in with a block or painted in with line. Each way is just as good as the other, just two different ways of doing it. Just while I've got the blue on the brush, it's rather nice to just bring a few little bits of sky um, through these uh, bushes because they are losing their leaves now. doing the, uh, the trees. So this, this tree is uh, more to the side of the picture. So I'm using a bit of um, emerald green and a bit of um, monestial blue in with the olive green. That's actually a little bit too cold. So I'm taking some raw sienna, putting that in with it. That's better. So without being perfectly exact, I'm getting the feeling of these uh, droopy branches, which I'm sure are terribly characteristic of the type of tree that it is. People come um, from all over the world to visit these gardens. So. Maybe if we do another stream from here, I'll look up what kind of trees they are if people are interested. I just love the shapes and colors. <laughs> that does fine for me. So you may wonder, how am I getting different colors without going back to the, um, back to the palette? 
So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm, I'm pushing either lightly or strongly. You see, I've got, uh, I've got this cold green on the tip of the brush, and down here I've still got some of the other um, green. So if I push on the brush, then I get back to the um, dark green. And if I am um, light with the brush, I get some of the, um, the colder green. No, if we were, if we were doing a, a Tuesday morning class and, and we were doing things step by step, I'd go at a slightly slower pace, but uh, plainly, you don't, we're not going to have the opportunity to sit here for hours because it'll get dark, but um, uh, plainly this is just um, what I do when I go out to get the information from the site. So um, I'm used to working fairly quickly because as a landscape painter, you, it's a skill that you end up developing because, well, at least a landscape pain, painter in Ireland, um, of course the Im Impressionists were um, um, loved to be out in um, the south of France or um, in climates where uh, you didn't have such variable weather. Uh, that's some yellow ochre there for those leaves which are really turned. So here in Ireland, we have to be a little quick on our feet to get the landscape in. Now, um, I'm going back to the violet. That's prism violet. Rather nice colour. It's my last bit of it. And a bit of emerald green. Lemon. More of the emerald. Have I lost the house again? Oh well, I'm painting the landscape there. The house is just there. You could uh, tip that water, please, and give me some more. Okay, so so I'm just you see I've marked in several different rolling layers of um, the uh, ground in the in the back there, and I'm just looking. Um, sometimes I squint my eyes up, which isn't just because my eyesight is not 2020 anymore. It's um, it's also that if you reduce the amount of light coming into your eye by squinting, then uh, the colour becomes less dominant and the um, tone is more easily perceived. You can try that if you like. Try it by squinting. Try it in the evening time before you turn the lights on. If you've got a painting in the room, um, you'll uh, see that if it's got um, good tone, it'll still look good as the light fades, but if the tone isn't very good, um, it'll tend to lose its tone. So I can see, you see that, that, that part of the landscape there, it's in underneath the bushes, um, it's got bits of soil and bits of red and so on in there, which eventually will go in. But the bits of soil, the bits of red, the turning bracken, all of that is um, the, the small shapes. So I'm not going to worry about putting those in for the moment. Big shapes first. Now, Right, the next biggest thing is this, um, uh, basically it's a, pa it's a wall behind, isn't it? So I'm going to keep my green brush for the moment, just to save on the water because um, poor Matthew doesn't want to keep coming up here to, to change the water. Okay, so we've got ultramarine blue and we've got burnt sienna. 
and it's mixed on top of that slightly bluey uh, grey that we already have. Now let's see, that might be too dark. I don't mind a little bit of good dark. I don't want too much too dark. So I'm going to my grey of the path now on the same brush. See some nice stonework visible over there just as, as the weir turns over. So I'm varying it, I'm warm and cold. How do I vary it? Well, if you look at the palette there, you'll see um, here it's more yellowy, here it's more blue. So where I want it lighter, I take from the more yellowy bit. Where I want it darker, I take from the more um, blue bit. There's a path that goes up there. You will see people walk on it, perhaps. Now, where I want it darker, back to the dark again. Darker on the edge tends to hold your eye into the picture. Anyway, it's dark underneath the foliage that's there. Also, it'll be dark where the water splashes all the time. It'll be darker right at the bottom. And over here, basically, I'm going to put foliage over it. So I don't want to make it slippery, but I also don't want bits of white showing through. So I just give it a very light tickle of the paint. Now then. We've got the darks that I need to put through the um, um, weir, uh, the, the whole of the uh, river here. So that's a lot of dark. Now, let's take some um, ultramarine blue, a bit of alizarin crimson, and back into this same um, pool of paint where I've been mixing all the darks for the background. Now, let's see what we can do with that. So we'll get one dark line going along. And I'll have a dark line for the weir. Now, had I done this for myself, I'd have spent an hour or two drawing it and I'd have the exact shape of the weir. I don't, but I, I, I don't at the moment, but I'm going to look. Now, you see there's a lovely curve in the middle of it, which really gives shape to the water as it comes over the weir. Okay, now. That's just more of the green. Now, here we want more of this green, don't we? A little bit of the medium is quite useful to help it to slip um, across the surface. So do you see that uh, the blue is in one distinct patch on the, on the water there? And I'm keeping that. And do you know, um, there's a heron that, that often flies, it, or he already did, flew, flew up here. Um, so 
the heron flying up the middle of the river is, is coming in before this picture is done. But not today, unless we see him. And I'm quick on the mark. Which might happen, you never know. Uh, the beauty of working on the site. Okay, now we've got all of these uh, main areas in. We've still got small areas back here that we need to fill in. So it's just a question of filling those in for the moment and then we'll show you the next stage. Okay, so this we call the blocking in stage because all I'm doing is I'm blocking each area in. Each area in its basic tone and colour. Giving the brush a good clean again. And more tissue. Okay. Sometimes to clean off my brush, I might shake it like that. But I wouldn't do this in Conrad and Catherine's garden because they'll have spots of paint around. <laughs> that wouldn't be nice. Okay, now before I fill those in, I see that I would like to be a little bit more precise with my yellow shapes. Remember the yellow shapes that I was putting through the background here? Because as I build this up, so the um, the shapes become more refined, so the tone comes more refined, so the colour comes more refined. Um, Suzanne would say that you can't paint without drawing, that the whole process of painting is um, that the colour and the line is so closely allied that the one um, begets the other. If you ever get a chance to look up um, Madeline Jay on Mount Usher Gardens, it's a fascinating story. Uh, not just um, the way that she saved the gardens, but also, um, well, the bit that I relate to. <laughs> uh, she's so, um, she was a, a very um, strong lady, but one of her absolute loves was horses. Um, and, and she had this incredible talent that she had an enormous spiritual connection with each and every horse that she owned. And she started at a really early age. She was four years old and her sister was taken to riding lessons, who was seven. And, um, and there she is, four, and the sister's getting all the attention and getting on the horse and being paraded about. And she's just silently crying. And somebody notices and asks her what's wrong. And she said, it's not fair. I want to ride. So her mother, Julie, got her, uh, not one to do things by halves either, she got her a cob, big cob, <laughs> for a four-year-old. So she goes up and uh, gets on the cob and she's up there with a stable lad leading her around. And, um, and she notices that her sister um, has control over her horse and uh, you know she's riding on her own independently the horse just walking nobody holding on to the horse so she thinks that well good for my sister it's good for me so she clicks on a horse and kicks on the horse and it's such a surprise for the poor old cob that he leaps forward which is such a surprise for the poor stable lad holding him that he drops it and off she goes cantering around the ring happy as happy as can be She was competing professionally, uh, well, um, on an international stage anyway, <laughs> maybe not professionally, but at 12. And she was um, international um, at 17 and uh, was won all sorts of things in the next 20 years. By the time I knew her, she wasn't riding anymore. She was a lovely older lady. So now I'm just putting in a bit more um, colour 
onto this tree in the back here. So it's a mixture of cadmium yellow and cadmium orange. I'm following with the flow of uh, the tree that's there. I'm not necessarily keeping exactly to what's, um, to the arrangement there because I'm putting in a few more leaves. Um, I, I'm sorry that we missed when it was really full of leaves. So I'm putting in a few more leaves. And, um, but at the same time, I'm being cognizant that it is the fall or autumn and the leaves are falling. So I'm also refining the shape, getting in the feel of the tree, but also putting in a few of the background colors just to break through. So once Madeline came here, the love of the garden, I think, probably um, took over from the love. Well, I'm sure she never lost the love of the horses, but she uh, focused on the garden. Of course, with the help of wonderful gardeners, but she was very hands-on for a very long time. So you see, as I go, I'm um, keeping with shape, looking all the time at the shapes that I'm putting in, but I'm also now um, putting in more form and almost drawing with the colour. Very different way of drawing though than you would from a photograph. It's drawing from the essence of the thing down to the detail of the thing instead of starting with the detail and trying to capture the essence. So these, this tree here, I remember, had um, red bits on the edge. So we're going to get some of those red bits. So it's cadmium red with a little bit of the cobalt violet in with it. Uh, sorry, it's a uh, prism violet. It's a uh, close colour to cobalt violet, which I would use in the oils, but it's called prism violet. You can st I don't know if you can still see the red berries on it, but they are still there. So where there's um, white canvas, I'm blocking in a tone that's closer to what, what there is there in front of me than the white canvas without being exactly precise about it. So that's a, that's a color or a tone that's um, similar to all the branches that are there. So I'm not actually seeing much sky through there. But I, I am going to want it to be a broken field, so um, I will uh, paint leaves on top of that shortly. Now, I don't want to, or I do want to, because I, I get carried away, as anyone does, I get carried away with um, having fun with the colour. But really, I need to be disciplined and block in these um, shapes before I do that, because that white, if I, if I make this correct against the white shape, what happens when, when the white changes? If the white is no longer white, it's no longer going to be the same balance. So I need to um, uh, block in this uh, balance. So this is the remains of the green that I used for up here. Um, 
on the brush that I was just putting in this ochre color with. So, just added a little bit more lemon. Now it's a little bit too quiet, I'll, I'll liven it up in a moment, but that blocks that in sufficiently for me to see into the background. And I'm going to use a little bit of emerald green in with the lemon onto the same spot. And this is for the um, perfectly kept piece of grass around the pond at Mount Usher. And see how that spins the path and all you have to do is paint, paint Paint. Oh, that was a fish jumping up the weir. Lovely. Now, if the heron will come, it will make our day complete. So that's some lemon with the um, permanent green, I think I put into it. because a little bit of light can filter in behind this uh, tree and get onto the lawn at the back there. Bring a little bit of that onto there. Now, we don't want it to, ha to have it as light as that here because it will distract us, but we can put a little bit more green into that. That's sap green and lemon just to bump up. The grass a tiny bit. Now that green follows through here, doesn't it? We've got all these lovely ferns in the wall. Quite a bright green. Now, you can see all the way back to the um, maple walk on the other side of the river, but the grass back there is colder. So I'm just going to paint that in over there. It's a little bit bright on my brush. So if I squiggle it in to get some of that gray color off, off this part of the brush, that'll dull it down a bit. And maybe it just a little bit of bluey grey to just really get it to settle, settle in. See how adding the bit of bluey grey just pushes it into the distance. Now there's a bit of a red bush back there. Well, it's not a red bush; it's a maple tree. Um, but it's in the distance, it looks kind of the size of a, of a bush. <coughs> Alizarin crimson and um, prism violet. Now we will put some brighter onto that in a minute. So that's a bit of cadmium going in with it. Now you remember this is the block in. So what I'm doing is, is I'm establishing everything in its space. And then I will um, stand back and look at it, make sure that everything is in its right space before I go on to do the um, next stage, uh, which might be after we have a cup of tea or coffee. Very quick break. That's a little bit of ochre on top of it. And then, of course, we're going to have um, all the lovely autumn leaves coming through here. Oh, 
obviously those are too strong, but it is good to get a little bit of a feel of the colour coming round. Now, in we're going to do a little bit more on this bush. So now I've got the, the tones around it. Do you see how that enables me to see, to put in a little bit more detail? So this is ochre, sorry, it's um, raw sienna. It's a little uh, greener than the ochre. In with the orange, cadmium orange. And I'm gonna have a bit of cadmium, uh, sorry, lemon yellow with yellow ochre and cadmium yellow. Okay, now we've started to block in through here, but we haven't done this piece yet. So the water actually has an, another area of considerable change of tone. So this is ochre with white and a bit of the bluey gray. And you see, this is where the um, water comes down from the mountain, gets all churned over. And it makes quite a specific pattern. Do you see where it comes over here? It especially turns over here. It's a light bit along the top and falls into a swirling pattern that makes a triangle. That's getting a little bit um, green. So when I've cleaned my brush, I'll go back with blue. But that's the idea of it. Now then, we've got an awful lot of light on the brushes, which I'm going to have to clean off in a second because we're going to have to go to some dark colours. Let me get some darker greens in. So I'm just by, um, by blocks instead of line building up the shape of the wall there. Uh, really, if I'd had the time, I would have drawn it very carefully. Now I'm just going to put in, I've got to clean these brushes because they're getting very gummy. Um, I'm going to put in the um, lovely uh, red flowers that come across here. And giving the, the bushes just a little bit more foliage than they have right now, because again, they did have more foliage. And they make a nice filigree of light um, dancing on the green and the dark shadows to take away from the harsh um, line of the lead-in. So we didn't talk about lead-ins. Do you see that I have a double diagonal lead-in? So a diagonal lead-in is a line that leads your eye into the picture. A double diagonal lead-in 
is a, a lead-in that goes both ways. So we have this one that goes this way, we have this one that goes this way. You have to be very careful with that because you don't want the picture to divide. So one must be more dominant than the other and there must be a strong pull that brings you back into the picture. Otherwise, um, otherwise you end up um, heading out of the picture. And I'm going to have, as I said, the heron flying up the river too. So this is olive green. Olive green is great for mossy walls in the shadow. Okay, Donovan, I, I don't know um, if I'll be able to hear you, but I don't know how we're doing on time. Um, my brushes are all gummy. It would be really good if I had a chance to clean them. So I wonder if we do uh, a 10 minute or a, a, a five or 10 minute break. I don't mind which. I just need to clean my brushes. Five minutes would be fine. Um, people can get a cup of coffee for five minutes. Um, so you come and tell me when that's convenient. It's just the paint's gonna dry on them and they're gonna take quite a bit of cleaning. So in the meantime, I'm putting, see there's a lovely daisy here. I gather it's a very rare daisy. Uh, we have it also um, by our gate actually. 321. 321, okay, so I've gone, okay. So, uh, so let's do a, a five minute break. You tell me as soon. I just got to clean up my brushes. Don, Donovan, a five minute break. Five minutes? Ten minutes. Okay, ten minute break. Ten minute break, and I, I just get cleaned up, and we'll be ready then to do the next stage, the third stage in the painting. So, um, I, I, I don't, I'll keep painting until Donovan tells me to stop because I'm not sure. Uh, when he's turning off. The problem, we have it all fixed up so that he can talk to me. The problem is that the, um, the weir is so noisy that I can't really hear him very well. <laughs> so um, I'm just still blocking in, I'm blocking in now the, the red flowers. So as I do that, I make a pattern. You see the pattern that comes across. Welcome back. <laughs> Wow, that was a quick coffee break. Now, there is a good reason um, uh, for me uh, taking a break to remind you that when you're working on the site, it's very easy to get very involved in what you're doing. There's many an artist that has gotten too involved with their work on the site and ended up getting a, a chill and suffering from it. So um, I hadn't realized that I was getting cold because I was too busy engaged with this. So I'm quite distinctly chilled. So there's a, another layer or two on now, but that's fine. Um, no, no worries, I'll get warm enough again while I'm working. Now, so we've, we've covered over um, most of the um, canvas now. Um, there are some smaller shapes that I'm going to put in, but really what we do at this stage is we make the picture become three-dimensional. We um, make it become round, not only in, in um, uh, light on one side of the tree and dark on the other side so that it becomes uh, something that you could pick up but also three-dimensional in depth so that um, this tree here stands forward from the trees on the other side of the of the bank so that you feel this space of air now blue is a very good color for doing that but you also want to have good tones so as I go through this next stage I'm going to obviously um, work with smaller and smaller shapes, but also more and more refined tone, which means that I'll be mixing a little bit more uh, precisely. So you'll want to follow the brush a bit more because it's not just big blobs of paint going on. It's a question of refining what I have. So the guts of everything is there. If there was anything that I didn't like, is if there were any shapes that I felt were in the wrong space or too big or too small or the wrong color or the wrong tone, 
then now is the time to change them. I'm not feeling any of that, so I'm quite happy to keep going, except that standing back, I saw, do you know what? It works the way it is. There isn't anything of significance in putting that house in there. The house is disappearing, and that's the way it was um, 15 years ago, um, and um, there was no house there. So there is no house there again. That's fine. Now, we have, we have, I think, first of all, to get the uh, light coming across and over the weir here, because I know that's something that uh, lots of people will be very interested in, uh, painting moving water. So it's, it's simple, really. You just get the right tone, the right tone and the right colour. So we want it to go away from us. We don't want it to come towards us. So I'm going to use the blue that is the colder blue, which is a uh, monestial blue. It's not a bright, bright blue. And um, I would start by building up the less obvious tones before I put on the, the final flicks of light. The final flicks of light are terribly juicy and exciting, but um, they won't mean much without having the supporting crew. So here we have a, a, a half tone of bluey light. And the water gushing over the weir. Now you remember it comes down here and it flows around the, the round bit and down it comes. There's an extra little um, stone there that it hops over. All these little details are, are lovely little things that you see on the on the site so it's not just it's not just a one-size-fits-all weir, it's an individual weir. It's the weir that we have here in Ashford. With the right shape and the right way that the um, water flows over it. Now, where I have, uh, because I'm working on the site, where I have bits of pink that get in with it, I'm just not going to worry about it. That can be sorted out in the studio at a later date. Not to mention with my tissue, which is about to be deployed. Good old tissue. So just working a few tones of blue through um, the, the bubbling, foaming froth. And you see, there's a distinctive pattern to the way the water flows out to join the rest of the river. You want to cap capture that. Now, where the water isn't quite as, as I want it to be, just a little damp tissue and lightly lift. And there, that actually gives me a half tone in itself. Okay, now we could take a few of uh, these um, strokes of monestial blue and white across through here so that we get a, um, a further ripple going back. And I don't mind actually if we have a little bit of the purpley colour. Now normally the paint would dry as you're working and, and it would skip over the surface a little more easily. But because there's so much moisture in this autumn air, not really doing that but it doesn't matter because this is not a finished picture this is um, what I'm doing in order to gain insight to the site in order to be able to take home to my studio a working sketch that by the addition of some oil paint I will get more subtle uh, tones and color and be able to build out from this to the finished painting So 
I use the acrylics because they're uh, extremely convenient on the site. Um, I can just put one plate, I just put these plates one over another, wrap it in a plastic bag and it keeps for um, uh, months uh, if it's sealed in a plastic bag and the moisture doesn't get out. Um, it, it, um, it doesn't hurt, it gets stuck in my fingers a bit, but uh, a little bit of soap and water takes that, takes that off. But it doesn't um, hurt my skin, I would have very sensitive skin uh, and oil paint. You really don't want to get it on you. Um, it's um, a, a bother to clean up the brushes with, uh, we use paraffin to clean the brushes. Um, but whatever solvent you use, it's um, nastier on your skin. But it is the permanent thing to use. So I would, I would use it in the summer um, and uh, in controlled ways on the site. But usually I would use it for the stage of developing the tone and the color uh, for this beginning stage of getting the information on the site really the acrylics are extremely well suited so I would very often use them but the acrylic colors are a little bit harsh and the tones are a little bit flat in nature uh, the oil paint uh, will absolutely give you greater depth of tone and greater richness of color so I use the two of them, but you know, the, the acrylics can give you a nice effect too, so whatever suits. But, you know, some people like the uh, rather flat cla clarity of the acrylics. It's, it's a matter of taste, isn't it? It's all a matter of taste. As is how much um, uh, detail you're going to put in now at this stage. So how much of this frothing, rolling, bubbling um, <laughs> water <laughs> and um, how much of the details of the leaves on the trees. Now, I'm thoroughly enjoying myself here and you can see I could get totally carried away with this weir. So I guess I'd better not get totally carried away with the weir. We'll just put the turnover here in light and then I'd better work on with my um, poor little trees that really need a bit more structure before I go away from here. Because this, this, this that I'm doing with the weir is something you can do from a photograph. This, this now is detail that I'm doing. So I should stop. Okay, what I absolutely have to do is to get some of the branches going through the background. And because I want a rhythm of line going through the background, um, I'll try it with this brush just, just to save having to clean it thoroughly and get another brush. But it's a slightly big brush for doing that. Uh, we might get away with it if I'm lucky. And if not, we'll go to a smaller brush. Okay, so I'm going to use, um, I'm going to mix it with a knife to try to stop the brush from getting too heavy with paint. And um, uh, burnt sienna. I just want dark browns really. So burnt sienna, uh, ultramarine blue, Alizarin Crimson. You see how I'm, I'm making a range of, of that with grey as I go across. And each tree is going to have a slightly different colour. So this tree, uh, the, the main tree is going to be quite distinctly mauvey, isn't it? Um, this one here. Do you remember that I put the big branches in on? Um, because that's the character of the tree. And he's a big, thick tree. Okay. Now, the tree that's behind is um, a little thinner and it has lighter branches sorry the flies are starting to come out now oh that's another hazard of painting on the site you may get flies stuck into your paint 
just leave them there. I don't worry about them. And when the paint is dry, they'll lift out quite easily. So while I've got the same color on the brush, I'm going to go for all the, all the trees, which are more or less that color. So this one over at the side is um, more, slightly more oakery mauve. So it doesn't really matter whether you make your brushes horizontal or vertical, whatever suits you. And he has some lovely droopy branches, which funnily enough seem quite dark, but that's because there's, there's light behind them. So now what we're doing is making a rhythm with line. So the final stage, which we're not really at yet, but I'm going to tell you about it because we may not get to the final stage today, two hours being rather a quick little glimpse into landscape painting. Um, but the final step would be to pull, to stitch the um, painting together with line. You'll see as we work, this rhythm of line is going to be very important to um, make a symphony in the background rather than individual trees just sitting there. So this tree is slightly more mauve. I hope Donovan's scene cameras are um, conveying all of that to you. Now the tree at the back is really more of a silhouette. So this is um, blue and brown, just dull. Because it's really just a silhouette. Now, obviously, I'm not putting in all the branches, both because of time, but also because I'm picking selectively those that I feel embody what I want to convey in the picture. So this is uh, more blue. making sure that he's rooted into the right place and right piece of the land. And then this, this one back here, the one that cuts through the house that we're not putting in. Again, there'll be more half tones of trees back there, but we can put a little bit more in now. But I'm anxious to get on to these because I know our time is going. Okay. 
And that's the other difference between uh, what we're doing with painting the scene and what you would do with a camera in um, uh, photographing it. We can selectively pick um, those bits of the foliage and the background that excite us and the bits that nah, you know, don't do a lot for us, well, we, we don't have to put them in. So that extra bush that I drew in there, I don't think I'm going to put it in there. I'm sorry, um, Sean, he's the head gardener. He might like that bush very much, but from this point of, um, this point of view, it's um, not adding a lot to my picture. So I think I'll just have this tree, this tree in its full beauty. want to overcomplicate it either. Now then, just as we have the red coming through here, we want to get a bit of red coming up onto um, uh, the um, thing here. Um, so I took a bit of green as well as the red because obviously there's green foliage supporting the, the red berries. When people um, paint, when my students paint um, uh, flowers or trees or um, bushes, very often there's a forgetting, there's so much excitement about the berry or the flower or whatever is so particularly attractive about it, um, that there's a tendency to forget the supporting cast, a tendency to forget the um, foliage that um, supports that um, delightful show of red or orange. And it's needed, apart from the fact that it's there in nature. If I just have a big solid blob of, of red, it's much less effective than having the green with a few bits of red and they're complementary colors. So they um, excite one another to the eye and stop the, the, the amount of red from being overwhelming, but make the red that's there really um, um, nourishing, really um, uh, satisfying. So that's uh, cadmium red for these uh, stronger bits, and then alizarin uh, red for the bits in, in the dark. Now, do you see, as I'm putting them on, I'm also putting them, putting them on not just as, as blobs, that, well, they are blobs, but they're blobs that are arranged in a particular way. They're blobs that are arranged as, they, as I'm seeing them, um, draped on these little triangles of foliage, little triangles of cascading foliage. Um, so they're quite different to these blobs or those blobs. There's a character to them. and just allowing a little bit of them to reflect down into the water. Now there's an advantage to the water being a little wet. Now as we come along here, the greenery changes and it becomes uh, more of a yellow green, um, although there's still some cold green in with it. So I've just mixed um, some yellow in with the green that I had on the brush. And I'm picking um, I'm picking shapes that I see there without being a slave to having every single shape that I see included. So I'm picking shapes that are characteristic of what I'm seeing without worrying that they are um, including every single one of those leaves. taking little little tips of lemon yellow and cadmium yellow where the leaves would just catch on the light, the light that I remember. Um, now I'm going over to more cadmium yellow for the leaves that are turning that I can see. That are turning yellow. As I make these patterns I'm very aware of the spaces in between. Um, so the spaces in between these um, uh, pieces of foliage 
uh, we would call negative spaces. So the spaces of, of um, space, of nothing happening. And they hold, they interlock and, and hold um, the spaces of positive shape, pure shape, of objects, of solid things that you would go over and pick up. Now I've added some um, ochre in with that for these um, big leaved things over here. Yes, if we, if we do this again, I think I really either have to look up what the flowers are or have somebody tell you what they are because it's an awful shame that I don't. I just appreciate how they look. My cousin comes over from Holland to specially study the trees here, so I'll have to get her on the job. So now I'm going back into the foliage there, picking out a, a, a few bits. I, I will bring some of the reds through as, as the browns, the browns of the ferns and the pinky browns of the dried whatever there is back there. But before I do that, I have this big shape over here that, that, that needs more attention. Here I am doing little shapes. These big shapes, they need to be uh, looked after. So, first of all, I'm gonna put some structure through the um, bush so that uh, we have a framework upon which the foliage sits. So it's like a hand that holds it. So we already have the color pretty much mixed up. Um, this um, browny, ochery grey that we had mixed. And I'm just adding a bit more purple through it to make some darker lines. And we'll get the structure of the of the branches flowing through it. And this is a bit of brine in with the purple. There's a bit of ochre there as well, because I'm mixing it on a yellowy green bit. As you see, the branches vary in color. And yes, it does matter. Uh, what the uh, shape is, because each, each bush, as any botanist will know, each bush has uh, a particular shape to, the, uh, to its branches. So I have to make sure that what I have is characteristic of this particular shrub. used to play a game with my mother on the long journey to Connemara and back as we were driving along to see if we could identify the trees just from the shapes, the shapes of the, the trunks and the crowns because you wouldn't see more than that as you were driving. But they all have their own character but each species has, has some similarity. Now, really, I should get a finer brush, and when I finish this, I will get a finer brush. But in the meantime, I'm getting that character. Because the, the, those silhouettes there against the sky are rather nice, even though they need to be slightly finer. While I'm, while I'm there, <coughs> and there'll be a few lighter ones, but while I'm there, I, I should put in the, um, the gate. So that's purple, that's uh, blue and alizarin crimson, ultramarine blue and alizarin crimson. And where does the gate come here? This is the path the other side by the pond. And that's the support of the gate.
Now, if you're not sure how to do the gate, if your spacing isn't very good, what you do is you um, start with top and bottom, and then you put a middle divider in, and then divide that in two, and divide that in two. And there you have your gate. Now, actually, because I've got that, that uh, support there, it's, um, it's a distraction having the second support that I'm removing it. See how easy it is to remove it? And in fact, I mislooked and there's um, horizontal here and another horizontal here, presumably to let the dog underneath or something, not one at the bottom. Okay, and uh, stronger support in here. Now, actually, that probably means I need to bring my grass out a bit. So let's do that. You can see the colours I'm mixing. Lemon and ochre and that green. bit more lemon and ochre just as it comes towards us do you see how that little bit of warmth just makes the grass more real as it comes towards us now as I've done that do you see how much flatter this bit is looking so as, as you as you start working you find that you have to keep working around to, to keep up but before I go on to that I do want to do a bit more with um, uh, the foliage here So now that we're um, making the um, uh, painting three-dimensional, we're using chiaroscuro and um, we're putting the light in as it catches onto the side of this um, bush shrub. And that's the wonderful thing about the autumn. There's such variety in the colors of the leaves. But you see that um, with each particular tree, it's like it's a family of colours. The colours all relate to one another. You can't just go dab, 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 dab all around the picture or you end up with it all looking the same. And you don't get the same depth and the same movement. So as I'm doing this, I'm aware of keeping that movement, both of shape and of colour, going through all of the picture. And we'll look at that in a moment when I'm not busy doing this. Now this, um, this live stream will be available as a, as a recording um, continuously through our website which is irishschooloflandscapepainting.com Irish, uh, I-S-O-L-P to make it short if it's easier for you, I-S-O-L-P So um, you can just go there and access the recording whenever you like plus recordings that we've done on our own property which is just half a mile upstream that way um, woodland, both in oil. Uh, we did that in the Bluebell Town. We did, we've done them during the lockdowns. So we did the first one in May when all the bluebells started coming out. And I thought, oh gosh, not everybody can see this. So we did the live stream. And then again um, in April um, from, from down by the river on our property. And then there's a few from the class as well. There's um, um, uh, watercolours and there's um, oils, there's portraits, there's landscape, um, there's mixed media, there's lots of different things there, all little free snippets or full demonstrations like this. Now, I'm just going to uh, <coughs> pick out a few of the individual stones because the shapes of the stones are rather nice so I'm going to pick them out in blocks first and then we'll um, do as I was doing in the background 
and tie the front also together with line. So you see how um, at all times you're working the whole picture together hand in hand. So the whole time you're balancing every bit one with another. It's not static. So these are uh, little stones that there are in the driveway here. Little loose bits of stone on the gravel. How are we doing on time, Donovan? It is 4.06. Oh, good. Oh, it's, well, we're at, so we're 4.06, but can we we're go six on? six minutes over, but um, everything's running fine. Yes. Okay, so I'm very happy to keep going for until half four when the light will really go. And if you want to keep keep listening do so if you want to go look at the website to see more finished work then um, also do so irishschoolaflandscapepainting.com so um, as you like I'm here and happy to keep going so I'm just changing the tone and the color very slightly so this is a little bit more blue you see from the same do you see why I use the these plates these are just old dinner plates and um, I find them much easier than those uh, palettes with little individual places for mixing the paint because I, I run one colour into another colour and, uh, and it works. Oh, you're putting more lights on. <laughs> Donovan's so brilliant. He even brought lights. He'll have me working here until it's moonlight because it will run out of power. And so then that's down to the darker, um, more purple colour. <clears throat> okay, I hope it's uh, making sense to you all. You are welcome to write in if you want to ask a question. I think we'll just have a bit of the wall peeking out here so that we see that the wall continues on. Uh, can you move that back a little bit, Donovan? It's in the corner of my eye. Okay. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Oh, that's much better, Donovan. I can see much better. <laughs> it's funny, you can end up painting um, really almost until it's dark because you're, you're sort of so involved with the picture that you don't, you don't well, you do notice that it's getting dark, but you, you sort of, I guess your eyes adjust with the, uh, with the painting. Um, <laughs> I didn't realize that it had gotten that dark. So that's a little purple that's gone in with um, in with the colour that I was using there, a little purple green. But you see, it works well for um, in the shadow of the um, the shrub there. Okay, now we've got some light through it. Now we need to bring some dark through it. So uh, we'll take another big old brush, and we'll just take a little bit of olive green, sap green bit of hookah's green or um, um, this is emerald green just to get a little bit more change of tone here some smaller shapes so as I'm going smaller and smaller strokes now I'm going to put a little so as the, sp the strokes get smaller so I'm changing the tone a bit more uh, tone and color so um, a little bit of orange and ochre coming in. Oh, that's uh, raw sienna rather than ochre, actually. Oops, that's a little.
a little exaggerated, but... Okay. Now again, um, if I were doing this for myself, I would certainly be standing back at this point in time. Why do we stand back? It's to, um, it's to enable you to get the big picture, to not get too caught up in the detail. Because um, it's easy when you're doing little pretty bits of fern coming through, the red flower with daisies as well. It's very easy to get so involved in that one little pretty bit that you forget about the balance with the whole. And the, 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 the secret to landscape painting is really to keep that balance, to keep that um, feeling of um, the spirit of the place where you are, rather than just the detail of the little flower study that you happen to be painting at that moment. Now, do you see how flat that's starting to look? The more that you work up one area, the more the next area needs working up. And you see the little tree over there, little bush, um, and it catches quite a lot of yellow in its leaves as it's starting to turn before they, before they drop. And it's nice to get a little hint of the moss on the stones here because it's so characteristic of the place. So you see, I'm trying to get the character of that plant, quite different to this plant. And the cold is starting to get through even this fleece, but I have another fleece. So um, you really do need, when you're, when you're out on the site, to bring layers to, to put on as the day goes by. Now, uh, there's a bit more red or reddish brown going in here. And do you see how making that bit of depth there pushes, pushes that um, gate further away from me, gives me the feeling of um, being able to walk up the path. And then we can carry it through a little lighter with um, orangey, purpley, ochery, yellowy, different bits of, of fallen leaves and we've got the wall as well let's not forget the wall here's my wall color so you see I've got three brushes now um, all with different colors on them so that I can swap from one to another quite easily Don't forget the white in with the um, colour, which gives um, some tone. There's some very light um, yellow leaves there, which are not terribly strong in colour, but they're bright in tone. Even on the, even on the um, uh, grass here, we have the same thing going on. The leaves don't choose where they fall. They go everywhere. Now we've put the detail of the 
um, leaves so we want a bit of detail for the grass as well so you put in a few different tones for the grass again getting slightly darker towards the edge helps to hold the eye in Okay, and that brings us back round to where we were doing the daisies earlier. And you see now they're looking a little bit plain and flat. So let's get a little bit of the texture of the mossy wall in behind. So that they can sing out there. Okay, now that's coming on. Do you see how flat it's starting to look in the background? So let's go back in there now with the... Um, the pinky, um, pinky green, the slightly pinky green. So I'm going to put out a little bit of pink just to save on time. Just to save me time. Because it doesn't want to be a bright pink. So we're getting very close now to um, wrapping up. So last chance really for questions. Now, do you see the subtlety of the tone now back there? There's a lot of different colors coming off on the brush. It's um, basically this pink color with um, on the same brush that had the greens on them. And you see how it just gives a little bit of distance. Now, where it goes over the tree, no worries. You can still just rub it off. Now, um, we can do a little bit more detail along here. We've got a lot of other flowers which are along here that we didn't put in until we'd established the ones in the front. So back around we go to these. I don't know how Donovan's doing with his power, but I know he was concerned that, um, that he would have enough power. He hasn't told me he's running out, so I'm sure it's all right. But if you did lose me, you know where to find me again on the website, irishschooloflandscapepainting.com. He's got an assortment of car batteries and a, and a car running and UPSs and all sorts of things. He should be all right. I hope. So just a little bit of extra uh, green at the bottom of the wall. And you see how it sinks, see how that gives space um, before the weir now. Uh, now we can catch a little bit of light on the top of the uh, wall and it gives a little bit of crispness and a little um, catch of, of light which then moves through the picture. Now we can do some actual modeling so that we get a light side and a dark side to the, um, to the trees back here. So there's some dark going in. Do you see how much rounder that makes it feel? Um, here underneath um, this bunch of trees, another bit of dark. Of course, at this time of day, the shadows are getting a bit exaggerated <laughs> in reality. So you've got to keep in mind what it would be 
in the light that we're painting. Okay, now we got back to um, our big tree here and it would be very nice to get some of the structure of that tree in. Which is distinctly different to the one in front. And it's a much more purpley colour. Oh, there's another fish. Okay, it really is starting to get dark now because I, I've got cast shadows from my um, from the lights. So I guess we're at nearly at time to finish. I'll just put in a little bit more on this tree, and we're going to just boost up the colour a little bit, same as we did here. So orange and ochre and cadmium yellow and of course as the light goes you would want to be careful with what colour you put on because um, as we spoke about it earlier with regard to tone you can see tone in the dark but colour you need light for So we talked about how you move your eye through the composition. This is the most important thing of painting a picture. So we began by, oh, I can see oh, the colour really is going, isn't it? Okay, so it's time to wrap up. So we began with establishing just lines, just geometric shapes. And the geometric shapes were such that it moved your eye through the picture. We began by putting in just the main lines, just the main trees. I think it was these two trees and the river and the weir and the path and the tree. And from that, we built to the smaller and smaller shapes, all the time keeping your eye moving around the picture. And you see the picture is very simple, although it may look complex. We've got a triangle here. We've got a, a bigger triangle here. We've got um, a, big rectangle here divided across so it makes another triangle. Um, these two triangles leave a rectangle here. Above, yes? A question? Okay, I'll let, I'll let Matthew walk here so I can hear the question and I'm just going to continue um, with this little bit and then answer the question. Okay, we've got another big rectangle up here. This rectangle is much bigger than that rectangle. Then we've got a series of rectangles through here and, and these are quite important rectangles and it's important that they're different sizes. You see those are di they're nearly the same but they are different sizes. So you've got three different sized rectangles here, this rectangle and that rectangle, five big rectangles. You've got your triangles and you've got um, then minor triangles in amongst the trees. You remember I kept angling the trees to make triangles another horizontal triangle there to balance all the vertical triangles. Then in amongst those, we've got circles. They're not complete circles, they're bits of circles. So here we have a circle, here we have a circle, um, and they're divided into smaller circles. The negative space here is, it's not a straight line here. I made it so that these red bushes come up, so they're um, a circle that holds the composition, like holding it in, in your hand. So everything interconnects and, and, and interweaves one with another, but they are basically very simple shapes. And if you put them down in the order that I showed you, it's very, very important that you do our steps in exactly the order they're shown, because if you skip ahead, it's like juggling with one orange, it's quite easy. And by the time you've got four oranges, you'll be dropping all of them, not even catching one. So start with the simple bits work on and then you can get quite complicated so now we've got all sorts of little shapes going on in here same thing happens with the tones the tones are simple um, blocks of tone and the tones lead your eye through the picture as do the colors you see 
the orange brings you up and around into the yellow and back around again. The reds bring you around. The blues bring you through the picture. It, it all weaves together. So the final stage is the interweaving of the linear part of it, the drawing the line. OK, that was important to say. The question. question, what are the diagonal leadings? So the di diagonal. So diagonal leadings, very good question. So can you see this very dominant line in the picture? So you can either see it as the line of the wall, or you can see it as the line of the path, whichever line you wish to look at. But it's a very strong um, line. And the reason it's called the lead-in is because it leads you along the path and through the gate there and into the picture. And then it's taken up by this diagonal. You see this line here is an important line because it takes your eye immediately then up to here where you explore the middle of the picture where the house was going to be but we decided not to include a house and then down this side and then the, the second diagonal lead-in is this one strong line of the weir so that could also be a diagonal lead-in but because it's smaller see it's short and this one here is three times as long it's called a secondary diagonal lead-in so it creates a pull a tension in your work which can be quite exciting um, it can also be difficult to handle so you have to have strong shapes that pull your eye back in so that's a diagonal lead-in so is that but this is the main one it's primary <coughs> hope that answers the question right in if not okay I can see that the light is really going because my paint is shining in the light um, I'll give a couple of minutes for any last questions and I'm just going to continue to put in a little bit more tone. Um, I'm going to work into here now, which is um, the area that we've um, most neglected. And there's a lot of very dark tone in there. So do you see, even just putting a few bits of dark there, do you see how that, again, it's like a hand holding it. I'm putting a bit of green in there as well as the purple. Which can reflect down into the water. One, what's that? No more, questions. no more questions, but lots of thanks. You're very, very welcome. Um, uh, if you like to write somewhere, Donovan will know how to get your names and addresses that we can notify you the next time we're doing something. I don't know, I, I'm, I'm not a technical person. However you wish to contact us, if you want to know next time we're at lockdown and we're doing one of these, we'll um, send out to you. If not, just keep an eye on the uh, Irish School of Landscape Painting website because we'll always post it there. So you're very welcome and thank you for watching and being patient as this proceeds and uh, hope to see you again. Bye.